The next topic of our presentation is email in 2020 and beyond. It will be by Len Schneider, VP of Industry Relation of SendGrid. Len Schneider is an over 15-year email and digital messaging veteran and the VP of Industry Relations at SendGrid. Len serves as an evangelist and proponent of best practices and he drives thought leadership and data-driven insights on industry trends based on the massive volume of email that SendGrid delivers on behalf of their customers. Today, he is going to speak about email in 2020 and beyond. So, please welcome Vice President of Industry Relations at SendGrid on stage, Len Schneider. Good afternoon and swadi krab. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about what email is going to look like in 2020 and beyond. My name is Len Schneider and I'm the VP of Industry Relations at SendGrid, as he said. I represent the company amongst a number of different communities that range from anti-abuse, anti-spam, to policy and best practices marketing forums. Now, some of you may or may not know, Twilio completed its acquisition of SendGrid in February of this year. We're now one big happy company. Part of the reason that Twilio acquired SendGrid was that both companies were sol solving really difficult challenges around communications and how to do it at scale. As a matter of fact, both of these companies had very similar beginnings. SendGrid was founded by three developers that want to find a better way to send email. They had started multiple companies, and every single time they scaled these companies, they ran into a common problem. Email at scale is incredibly difficult. So the three developers that started Twilio a decade ago also ran into a similar problem. They looked at the 100 plus year old phone network based on copper wires and said, there's got to be a better way we can build SMS and phone communications into our applications than the way it was done then. So they went about building eight modern APIs for developers to connect their apps to telephony. Today, both platforms have scaled to galactic reach. SendGrid delivers over 50 billion emails a month on behalf of 85,000 paying customers, and Twilio powers over 70 billion interactions a year, and 100 million messages transit its systems on a daily basis. Together, the company now can reach customers on any channel across any device. It's where they are. And our customers are on your phone and in your inbox every single day. So I want to do a very brief recap of what email was like and where it started. And I promise I'll keep this to exactly one slide. The first email was sent in 1971 by Ray Tomlinson. In 1976, Queen Elizabeth II became the first monarch and head of state to ever send an email. She's a pretty cool lady, I got to say. Uh, in 1978, Gary Thurk sent one email to 493 people to advertise a new Deck Alpha mainframe. He is known as the father of modern spam and is probably the first person to literally break the internet. Okay, in 1982, the word email was invented. And that same year, the first smiley was sent in email. But the really significant thing happened in 1993. Because in 1993, webmail was invented. And webmail did two very important things. One, it allowed more people to access email because you didn't have to use a client like Pine or Mud. It gave birth to companies like Rocket Mail and Hotmail. But the second thing it did was that it created imagery in email. And we are an image uh, obsessed society. So no longer was it pure text, it was now done in HTML. So now we got to talk about what email's like today and why it's persisted since 1971. It's dead, right? Nobody uses email. Well, if you've read any of the pundits, you realize that there's been a lot of digital ink spilled about the death of email. As a matter of fact, I love this one, why email will be obsolete by 2020. And that's coming up really fast here. People have talked about Slack killing email, about Facebook killing email, Twitter killing email. Even the Wall Street Journal got involved with it. And others have actually thought about what, how privacy changes are going to kill email. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, what you need to remember is that email has persisted since 1971. And like Mark Twain said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Email is not dying. Quite to the contrary, email is evolving. And it's changing in very significant ways. 
But the reason it's persisted so long is because it has an unmatched ROI. According to a recent litmus report, for every dollar of investment, there's a $42 return on email. And there's almost 7 billion email boxes on the planet. I want a show of hands. How many people have more than one email address? More than two? Keep your hands up. More than three? Four? Anybody have more than 10 email addresses? OK. I see one hand in the back. We should talk. That's, that's a problem. We, we need to figure that out. So anyway, email is the most popular activity on a mobile phone. We have these mobile devices in our pockets. And some would say that the only purpose we have them is to watch videos. I would say there's another purpose. It's actually to access email. Um, additionally, we are going to release a consumer survey next month that we looked across generations to figure out how people use different types of communications. And one of the startling things we discovered about um, the, way, the way communications are consumed for marketing across all generations, from the youngest Gen Zers to baby boomers, was that email was the preferred method for businesses to contact them. Email is how commerce happens. And two years before that, we did another survey to find out about the persistence of email. And what we discovered was that Gen Z, the youngest generation, which at that time was high school to college age, they actually think they're going to use more email because it's kind of a rite of passage. Email is how you engage with the professional world. But more importantly, email is the documentation of your digital lives. Think about where we would be without those shipping receipts that you get when you buy something online, or the notification, or any of the other transactional messages that literally help you understand what you've done and what you can expect in the mail. So we set the stage. We know where it came from. We know why it's still popular today. Let's talk about the future. And first thing we need to talk about is hyper-personalization. Email has the potential of creating very, very personal experiences. And depending on if you're a science fiction fan, those personal experiences might look a little bit like this. But I would say that's a little creepy. That's a little too personal, right? And if you've read a bit about this, you know that it's driven by AI and that AI is going to eat the world. Well, this is kind of what happens when AI eats the world. So we don't want that to happen, OK? But we do want to make email more personal. So I'm going to give you two case studies. I have a couple of these Echo Dots around my house. And every single time that Echo Dot has arrived, literally by the time I get upstairs to open the box that the mailman delivered, there is an email in my inbox telling me how to use that Echo Dot, what to download, and how to take advantage of my new device. That's a really powerful example of hyper-personalization. This bridges the online and offline world. And it's not trivial to do. Another example, our customer eBay sends a lot of email, but they have a unique problem. They have no inventory. Their inventory is everything that you and I put into their system to sell to each other. So they've developed a proprietary technology that updates the content of the offers at the time that you open the email. And it's allowed them to do two things. They can send less email because of it. Because let's face it, it's like the biggest turnoff, biggest sad panda moment when you open an email, you click on an auction, and it's already expired because it's been sitting in your inbox for a week. This is actually highlighting a trend that we've picked up in the industry. People are sending, over the last couple of years, less emails per month on average. But we're seeing a higher open rate. Even though the volume has gone down by 20%, the open rate has surged by almost 30% between the last two years. Because people are delivering greater value with every email as opposed to just sending as much email as possible. That's a surefire way to get someone to unsubscribe from your emails. But again, Hyperpersonalization is aspirational. It's not easy to do. It's actually really, really challenging. So I just want to give you a couple ways that you can think about personalizing your messages. Start with the subject lines. We know that 41% lift can be achieved just by personalizing a subject line. What are you more likely to click on? A subject line that doesn't have your first name and doesn't know what you've bought, or one that does? Think about that. We looked across to figure out what kind of email clients people in Thailand were using to access their email. And not surprisingly, Gmail is 50% of that market share. They're the largest mailbox provider on the planet. So understanding the nuances of how your email will look when it lands in a Gmail client gives you the opportunity to code for your users. Understanding the kinds of mobile devices that people use to access their email is another way to create experiences that A, are meaningful, and B, will work across 
this crazy fractured landscape of various email clients and different mobile platforms. Understanding when people want to receive communications and when they don't is actually critical. In our consumer survey, we discovered that people don't want to get emails in the evening. That's family time. That's when you sit down to dinner as a family and hopefully you can get your kids to get off Facebook to talk to you for five minutes. We also discovered that frequency is really important. How do you figure out how much email people want to receive? Preference centers. They've been around for a long time. Give your customers the ability to tell you, give them the ability to send you a signal of when they want to receive email. This goes a long way into establishing a trust and relevance. So now let's talk about interactivity because email is becoming more interactive. Last year, Google released AMP for email. This is an adaptation of a mobile technology that was designed to speed up mobile web pages that has been applied to the inbox. It is going to create interactive elements from accordions to carousels and other functionality like get and post. This is an example of one of our customers, Doodle, that helps you basically organize uh, meetings using calendars when people don't share a similar calendar. This is all happening in the inbox as opposed to going out to an app or a mobile site. It creates less friction to conversion. Instead of waiting on something to load, you can do it all in the inbox because we spend so much time in the inbox. So you might be asking, what's in it for me, right? Well, simply put, happier customers, ones that can do more with your emails as opposed to just get led back to a site or an app. But more importantly, there are multiple platforms that are now supporting this technology. Outlook, Yahoo, and Mail.ru have all signed on to support the AMP standard. So it's not just about email, it's also about these other massive domains. But interactivity has been around for a long time. This is an example of a mobile shopping cart built into an email using CSS3 and HTML5. This was really advanced stuff at its time, and it allowed people to add a limited number of items into a shopping basket in an email client and then convert on the spot. This is challenging and advanced kind of design, but it shows you the possibility of the email inbox. So we now have to talk about security. This is the part where you guys probably fall asleep, but bear with me. I'm going to tie it all together. There's a saying among cybersecurity professionals that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when a company is breached. The other thing that they'll tell you is that a lot of data breaches start out as successful phishing attacks. As a matter of fact, 73% of companies reported that they were the subject of a phishing attack in the last year. The scarier number is that 30% of all fish are opened by the people that receive them. That's truly terrifying. Why am I bringing this up? Well, there are three technologies out there, three standards for how you can protect yourself from having your domain fished and people abusing your brand. The first is SPF, stands for Sender Policy Framework. This is a simple association of one IP to one domain creating a linkage that this IP can send email on behalf of this domain. The second was developed later called DKIM, which stands for Domain Keys Identified Mail. This was a cryptographic solution using a public-private key pair that basically can ensure the integrity of your message in flight so that if someone tries to lift parts of it, you have a way of protecting yourself. But DMARC is the thing that ties it all together, and here's what I want you to know about DMARC. DMARC is a policy that you can communicate through your DNS to a receiving mailbox provider like Gmail or Hotmail or Outlook or Yahoo. And what you're telling them is, hey, if someone sends an email that's claiming to be from me, but it fails an SPF or a DCAM check or both, don't deliver it. Think about the power that gives financial institutions to keep every single person, each one of you, safe from a phishing attack because now Gmail won't deliver a message if it knows it's a fake. 80% of the world's inboxes are protected by DMARC. They will actually act on a DMARC policy. That's about five and a half billion inboxes around the planet. Here's the sad part of it. The private sector is not taking advantage of this technology. They're not publishing enough reject policies in order to truly protect each and every single one of us from this. So you might be asking, What's in it for me? Why is this significant? Three primary reasons. One, you're protecting your brand. Two, you're protecting your consumers. And three, 
you're making the internet a safer place. Just let's be frank, it's kind of a dumpster fire. We want to make it a really safe place. But more importantly, there are benefits coming based on email authentication. BIMI is a new standard that stands for Brand Indicators for Message Identification. There are companies working on creating a visual trust icon in the inbox that is tied to your email authentication, and it's a logo that you can publish in DNS and will display. How does this work? Well, Yahoo ran a test to find out if there is a, if there's a lift in the way people use email based on this trust indicator. Some of you may have seen it. Anyone ever seen a green lock in their Gmail or some of those things? Yeah, there you go. That's a trust indicator saying that that is a known quantity. BIMI is the next step. So they sent people emails that had no visual trust indicator, a generic trust indicator, or actual brand logos. And guess what? The logos had a 10% lift in click-through rates. Because like I said, we are a visual society. We trust what we see. And it's important to use email authentication. The only way this BIMI standard works is if you use email authentication. Because you have to be a good actor. And you can verify that you're a good actor through your email authentication. These companies have been piloting BIMI right now. It's still under development, but it is an internet, an IETF track standard. So let's talk about Schema. Schema's been around for quite a long time. And what Schema is is a way of doing markup in a structured format to create certain experiences. There are about 10 million websites and emails out there that use Schema to deliver information in a usable way. This is a classic example that if you get a flight confirmation to your inbox, it may look something like this in a Gmail client if the person sending the email is using Schema. Schema was created by Outlook, Yahoo, Yandex, and Gmail. It's an open source standard, but guess what? You actually have to use email authentication when you register your use of schema with Gmail. So again, we have to take steps to protect the inbox. So let's put it all together. Emails can arrive to the inbox if they're fully authenticated using BIMI to display a, bland, to display a brand logo so you can communicate to your recipient, hey, this is what my email should look like. Schema can create discrete elements within the email, and AMP can create interactivity. So, locality and privacy. Because I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the changes in privacy going on in our world. Ever since GDPR went into force last year, there have been new privacy policies popping up all over the world. As a matter of fact, India and Brazil passed privacy laws that are almost co copy and paste of GDPR. They have a lot of the elements. In the United States, we have no overarching privacy policy. Every sector gets to define its own privacy regimes. This list of crazy laws that, is going, that are going through state legislatures is what we have to contend with in the United States. In Thailand, the Personal Data Protection Act was published in May of 2019 and goes into force next year. It has a lot of the guaranteed rights of GDPR. So we generally tell people is that you should take the strictest regime out there and try to comply with it. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't necessarily know if your customer is in Thailand, Malaysia, France, or the United States. The internet's an anonymous place. But for the record, I'm not a lawyer, nor have I ever played one on TV, so seek advice of counsel. But take stock of the fact that the way you treat data, the way you collect it, store it, change it and process it, is now part and parcel of your email marketing campaigns because email is a data-driven activity and it requires a massive quantity of data that, about your customers to be able to deliver a personal and interactive experience. So, to recap, know your audience, authenticate your messages, less is more, take advantage of all of the interactive elements out there. And did I mention authentication? I'm gonna harp on this because the internet is not necessarily a safe place and we wanna make it safer for everyone and understand the privacy regimes of where you're delivering email because it's gonna become more and more important as more countries pass stricter privacy laws. And because I'm a child of the 80s, I get to leave you with this image because the future for email is so bright it's gotta wear shades. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the rest of the show. I'm around for questions.